Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Steve Edelman, and welcome to today's TCOYD podcast. Unfortunately, my partner in crime, Dr. Pettis, is not around today. But most importantly, uh, we have an expert in the area of health insurance, uh, George Huntley. So, George, uh, give the give our listeners an idea of what you do and your background and how did you get into this area that everyone hates to talk about? <laughs> exactly. People hate this topic, but thank you very much for having me, Steve. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, again, George Huntley, I am a type one diabetes patient for 39 years. We'll be 40 in March. I am the CEO of the Diabetes Leadership Council and the Diabetes Patient Advocacy Coalition. I'm also a past chair of the board of the American Diabetes Association in my other day job, I'm, a, I'm the chief financial officer of a professional services firm. And in that role, I've been the plan administrator of the self-insured employer-based health plan for over 25 years. And it was that experience that Lynn gives me a bit, a bit more insight into how health insurance works than, than most. George, I don't believe you do all those things. That is a lot of different important things that you're doing. And and, and and you collect teddy bears f- f- as a hobby. I love it. Um, George, uh, the, the listeners should know that on our TCOID website, we have several articles you have written uh, that will go into some of the things we're going to talk about in probably more detail. And of course, you've videotaped uh, lectures for us as well. So for you folks that want more and to learn more about George, uh, and his other organizations, you can go to our website. Well, let's let's start. Uh, we're, t- we're, we're taping this podcast in November, and that's the open enrollment period for most healthcare plans. So tell tell our listeners what is the open enrollment period and what are the, what are the dates? Are they really the same every year and and what to be aware of? Yeah, so they are typically the same times. It, it, whatever your plan is, most ca- most plans are calendar year, not all, but most. So the open enrollment period tends to be November uh, to December. Some talk, start early in October. So everybody's got to look at what their plans are. Some have mid-year plan year renewals, but the, most, the majority of them are, are calendar year. So this is the critical time. George, I, I get emails from my insurance you know, at right about the beginning of November. And I, I never, they send me reminders. I never get around to it. And I'm stuck in the same plan for a whole year. Well, and that's if they ought to renew you. Um, so uh, <laughs> what you really should be doing is, and, and, and there are reasons why you, many reasons why you actually want to pay attention to that at, at open enrollment and make, and make an informed decision. In many cases, the plan you're on is the plan you need to be on, but you have to make annual elections for things like uh, your flexible spending account, your health savings account, and things like that that go along with it. Uh, so you should be paying attention to these and not don't let those opportunities go to buy, go by. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. Um, now, when you look at uh, your premium offerings, what kind of things should we look at? Uh, you know, I know there's things like dedu- deductibles and cost sharings. What what kind of information do we need to know about that? Yeah, I think the, the key in selecting what's the right health plan, you know, you start with cost. It's not all about cost, but let's start with cost. So you want to look at the total cost of the plan, not just any one component. So the total cost is the combination of your premiums, your deductibles and your cost shares, which is what you pay after the deductibles. Now you got to do some math and most people hate math. They go running, screaming into the night when you got to do math. But unfortunately you got to do a little math here. The good news is there's only three components and two of the three are pretty easy. They're fixed. The premium, you know what that is. It's you, your employer tells that to you or the insurance company tells that to you. That's not going to change. Mm-hmm. The deductible is a fixed number and a person with diabetes is typically going to meet their deductible 100% of the time, unless you've got really, really, really good insurance that bypasses all the deductible for your diabetes care. Most of us meet our deductible. So that again is in your total cost calculation, that's fixed. But George, um, doesn't it depend on how much your deductible is? Certain insurance companies, you know, they want you to spend a ton of money before they start helping out, but they'll tell you. That's exactly right. Yeah. So you need to know what that is. But again, you know, if you're comparing plans, 
um, you know, you'll know what that plan deductible is. And to, in order to find out what works for you, you got to know what your deductible is and whether you can afford it. Um, but you're right. That, that's what you have to pay before the plan's going to start covering anything for you, before you get into um, copay on doctor's visits, copay on, on drugs, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that deductible number is, is a really important number. But you know, from a total cost math, it's easy because you know what the number is. Now, before you get to cost sharing, which I have no clue what that's about, I get patients that email me and they say, hey, I'd like to get this procedure done. I'd like to <clears throat> stockpile some of my diabetes medications before the end of the year so that they can get it in before they have to start paying off the deductibles. Right. And that's a great end of year tactic. Okay. So if you have most people, by the time you get to the fourth quarter, we've already met our deductibles. So let's go ahead and, and re-up all of the supplies that we can while I'm, I'm only going to pay a very small amount of that so that I don't have to, you know, bite the bullet in Jan- on January one, happy new year. Here's a thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. So what is cost sharing? Cost sharing is the part that you pay after the deductibles met. So, uh, you know, when you when your deductibles finally met, then you still owe copays. And if you're, you know, having surgery, you're having other things going on, or or in specialty drugs, sometimes you're paying a percentage. So, if you're in a seventy thirty plan or an eighty twenty plan, you're paying thirty percent or twenty percent of the cost of that procedure, that service, or that drug. In the case of drugs, you may be paying list price of it, 20% or 30% of list price. But either way, you're paying back your cost share. And so you need to know what that's going to be uh, because you pay that until you get to the total out-of-pocket max on the plan. So, you know, most plans have a catastrophic limit. Maybe it's nine grand, maybe it's eight grand. You, each plan's a little different. But you need to know what that, you know, how much you're going to be paying during that, that post-deductible period. That's kind of an, an, that, That's the hardest part to know. But at the same time, it is, you know, you, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. So you just got to figure out what the bites of the elephant are. And, you know, we, we have diabetes. We, we, we're on insulin. Uh, we take other medications. That's a finite number. But make the list. What's your medications? What, are that, what does that cost? I'm seeing certain doctors. I know what, how many times I'm going to see and I know what you charge. Um, and I'm having lab tests. This is, this is, it's, it takes a little bit of work, but it's, it's, it's not impossible to go through the process. And if you know that you're having a procedure like a surgery, like your, like your patient, uh, you definitely factor that into the equation. Yeah. You know, um, you're right. Some of those, you can estimate what you're going to spend on drugs, devices, insulin, CGM supplies, but, um, and doctors, but you don't really know what's the unknowns, which is, you know, you get in a car accident or you all of a sudden you have the worst kidney stone, you need a MRI. And so I think it's important to know because your insurance company, you know, mine, I got to pay like, I think it's 10 or 20% of some of these other type of scans. And that could be costly for sure. But, you know, you just got to have a little, I guess, uh, leeway that, you know, you might spend more, but knowing those percentages, I think are important and knowing what are typical uh, percentages that are fair and and some that are not, because I would imagine the higher the percent that you pay for the cost sharing, your premiums might be lower. That's right. So yeah, if you're in an 80, 20 plan where, where the insurance is covering 80% and you're only paying 20 is, is more expensive than a 70, 30 plan where you're only, well, you have to pay 30% and a 60, 40 plan is going to be cheaper for you. But if you, if you use it a lot, it might not be cheaper. Yeah. I tried to get a facelift, but they wouldn't approve that. Darn it. (laughs) Um, Well, George, um, in one of the articles you have on our website, you talk about the three D's of health insurance. And I think that was an excellent article. I'll let you go through what you mean by those. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, because they, they are important to in term determining the right plan for you, because it's not just about what's cheapest, right? You don't always pick the lowest bidder when you're uh, hiring a contractor for your house uh, or, or doing something for your business. So uh, the three D's are about ensuring that your doctors, your drugs, and your devices are actually covered by the plan. Uh, that you're looking at, that you're considering. So, you know, many of us don't want to switch doctors when we're switching health plans or changing out so that you, we need to make sure that we go into this well-informed before we make the leap. 
Uh, there's a lot of qualitative access, the, the qualitative parts to this. The hard part is knowing if your doctor drugs or devices are actually are actually covered. That's the hard part, uh, and figuring that out. And especially that can be challenging if you're considering a new plan or joining a new employer, uh, and you're not already in the employee portal and have access. To, it, it may it may be a little bit challenging, but there are there are key resources that you can look at. The first the first would be the plans website. So go to the plan website. It may be. You may have it at, you know, maybe the plan itself. It may be through your employer. Uh, typically, you can find a lot of information there. The doc list of doctors, uh, the drug formulary can often be at um, it got reached from that portal. Um, your HR department can be a great resource of that. Um, your insurance broker, if you're going through a broker, they can help you for this. And uh, many plans will have an 800 number. Uh, and uh, those 800 numbers can help you. Uh, you can you can get through that process. So you know you got to reach out and figure out whether your three Ds are in fact covered, because um, it's really important uh, that you that you don't get blindsided once you're in. Oh, it's so important to us folks living with diabetes. Now you mentioned a healthcare broker. Um, how does that work? Are they good? Do you suggest that? Where do they take their cut from? They're going to take a cut from the premiums for sure. Um, they are, if you are seeking individual coverage, I recommend using a broker. Um, I really do. And some some folks on Medicare, you're trying to get a Medicare Advantage plan, et cetera. Uh, sometimes the, you know, those brokers can really help you navigate those waters. So I I, I would encourage you, you to consider using a broker for that. They 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 can answer your questions and and help you get to what you need in order to, to figure out what your if you're again your three d's are covered yeah it could actually save you a ton of money in the long run when you say they're they get paid out of the premiums like i'm sorry to be so dense on this but am i paying for that or is the the insurance company paying well i mean you're paying because the insurance company rarely just writes a check out of goodwill right so uh they're going to take a percentage a commission if you will so it's they're in a commission business game I so see. um you're not paying you're not writing a check to the broker you're writing a check for your premiums and the broker's getting paid that way i see okay now this area to me gets so confusing enough we have the the ppos the hmos the epos um I got a PPO because George, you know, 10, five years ago, everyone said that's, that's the best. You can pick your own doctor. And, and I work at UCSD and I see people on HMOs and sometimes I can't really tell uh, too much difference between those two. I do, I do know that I pay more deductible and a higher percent because of PPO. So I don't know, maybe you can help explain that mess to us. Yeah, sure. It, it's alphabet soup is what it is. And they, they create these acronyms. So a PPO and the generality is they're describing how a plan is going to operate, how they're going to function with the network and, and restrictions within the network. So a PPO is a preferred provider organization. And, and that, even though despite the name preferred provider, it's actually the broadest network you're going to run across where the, the broadest access to doctors is typically in a PPO. Mm -hmm. um, an HMO is a health maintenance organization. They typically have a more restrictive uh, group of docs. Um, and most notably in HMO, they have the famous gatekeeper, which people hate. Uh, right. So if you need to go see a specialist. You got to first go see this person, this, this primary care uh, gatekeeper before you can go see your endocrinologist. And in the world of diabetes, that's a disaster. So make sure that, that your the HMO you're joining doesn't actually put that hurdle in place. It's not in their best interest, but that's the playbook they mostly go by. So it's important to understand how that plays out. Um, as you're as you're looking at all of these uh, at these types of plans, and there's even a worse one, if you will, from a restriction perspective, called an EPO, an exclusive provider organization, and and that, as as the the title might imply, is is the most restrictive. It's going to have the smallest group of doctors, and what they've done is they've negotiated contracts with this this you know one small group of docs in, in, within a geographical area. And uh, so they've gotten a really good discount on that. And they're giving that that group, that small group of docs, a large uh, a volume of work. So it's a volume discount play. If your doc happens to be in there, could be great. 
But if it's not, then you, you, you may be looking at having to make a switch. Yeah. You know, George, you mentioned the gatekeeper. I hate gatekeepers. And uh, sometimes the primary care doctors, they don't like it either. And it is a waste of time uh, and effort on everybody to make a visit, to go in and ask for something that you're going to be eligible for anyway. But I, I, I would say this for you folks out there, make, get a good relationship with your doctor. Uh, they might be able to take uh, recommendations of what you want through the, um, you know, the electronic medical records. They might do a quick video visit to just, you know, uh, make sure everybody's happy at their administrators that you had a visit and send your doctors chocolates and presents during the holidays. It goes a long way. I'm not kidding. I go to Seize Candy, I buy a bunch, and then I hand deliver them. And the staff just loves it. And I get special favors. That's awesome. Great, great counsel. You heard it right here, folks. That's and and you know it's funny because the the the, the sh- you get a lot more with sugar than vinegar uh, when you're trying to get things done. So uh, you know sugar isn't necessarily good for people with diabetes, but I think in your case it's a good idea. In moderation, George. Okay, <laughs> now now you've also uh, in your huge collection of the Alphabet Soup huge bowl. You talk about HDHP, which stands for High Deductible Health Plan. How does that enter into the mix? Well, uh, HDHPs, these high deductible health plans, um, can they can have the same networks as an HMO, a PPO. Uh, they can have the same similar restrictions within the networks. But what they also have are two key things. First, as the name would imply, they have a high deductible. Uh, and so the minimum deductible for an individual in 2023 is $1,500. And in a family, it's three grand. Now you can say, well, shoot, that sounds pretty low in today's world. Uh, 1500 would be a great plan. The problem is, as I mentioned, that's the minimum. Most plans are substantially higher than that when you get into these high deductible plans. The good news is your premiums might be lower because you've got this high deductible, this high, high deductible. But, um, you know, you got you to gotta balance that into the equation. The second thing is that they require um, drugs to be part of the deductible. And so with drugs being part of the deductible and a PPO, you may find yourself in a scenario where the deductible is only for your major medical stuff and all your drugs are immediately into a copay, which is Mm -hmm. great for a patient with diabetes or any chronic illness. But in HDHP, the, when they created these things, they, they dictated by Congress said that, that drugs had to be part of the deductible and opened up, frankly, Pandora's box to, high, to patients' exposure to high cost, which is a horrible thing. So you got to be a little bit aware of that um, as we go. Um, and the other piece to understand is in a high deductible, it's more important to understand a high deductible plan is whether any of your chronic disease care is treated first dollar as preventive coverage. So it, some, some high deductible plans, if they're, if they're designed well, um, will actually have disease management as preventive care. And it just totally bypasses the deductible. You're immediately on the copay, et cetera. And, um, in that case, it could be really well, work out really well for the patient. Uh, but you have to ask these questions. It sounds like this plan might be good for people that are extremely healthy and don't uh, plan on using the healthcare system. Yeah, they're super for people who are extremely healthy, for sure. Uh, absolutely. Um, and again, you it may actually be the lowest cost option that you run, a, run across if you compare all of these plans. Depend, it depends on a lot of the variables and how the, how the employer or the insurance company set it up. But the other thing the high deductible plan will hit you with is it could cause you a cash flow issue. It may be your lowest total cost all in, but you may be paying all that cost in, in the first quarter of the year. And if you, if you can't afford that, uh, then maybe that's not the right answer for you. It may, it, again, it may, by the end of December, it may be, it may be the cheapest, but in the meantime, you haven't been able to put food on the table or pay rent. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of people run pretty tight budgets these days. So, you know, so that, that, that's a very important point. Now I've heard you mention before, there may be some tax advantages. Yeah. There's tax, there's a tax advantage to the high deductible plans. There's also some tax advantages to the PP in, in within the PPO. So let me just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, 
first off, if you're getting your 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 health insurance through your employer, and half of the country is, about half of us are getting our, our insurance through the employer, um, the employer is going to take your premiums pre pre tax. So you're going to save whatever your tax rate is on your premiums. So if again, if you're comparing that to your um, to an, an exchange plan where you are paying it with post tax dollars, uh, that's a that could be a third. It could be twenty to thirty percent savings. You get to a high deductible plan. There's these things called health savings accounts that perhaps people have heard of. Uh, those are wonderful things. Again, if you can afford to put some money aside, it allows you to pay for your deductibles and out-of-pocket costs using pre-tax dollars. Yes. So that's that can save you, again, 20 to 30%. Now, these things are health savings accounts are actual bank accounts. Their bank accounts has your name on it. It's with a bank. You put your money in it. Usually comes out through your payroll, but not necessarily always. And you're putting in pre-tax numbers uh, into this, pre pre-tax dollars into this. And then you you are paying yourself, or you're using a debit card off of it for your deductible purchases and whatever. But you have to have the money in the account. So if you haven't funded the account in January and you have a need for it in January, you have to wait until the money's there to pay yourself back. But the good news you can in fact pay yourself back. Got it. Got it. So you would have to, this would be through your employer, obviously. You got to find out if they, is it also called a cafeteria plan? Well, I, no, a cafeteria plan is um, what allows, it's, it's, it's section 145, I believe, but it, it's what allows you to the employer to withhold your premiums pre-tax. So when you see a cafeteria plan, typically it means they're offering three or four options, PPO, HMO, HDHP, et cetera. And you going through the cafeteria to pick which one you want. That's where that, that terminology came from and allows the employer to do it. And I, I, I would like, I want to touch on just a, a tax scenario for PPOs. Uh, so Please. we've talked about HSAs and you can put uh, $3,850 as an individual in your HSA in 2023, seven grand, 7750 for families. FSAs, flexible spending accounts, are for, uh, again, the same purpose. You're paying your, your out of pocket, your deductibles uh, pre, with using pre tax dollars. Uh, you can't use those in a high deductible plan. Uh, and, and an HSA doesn't work in a PPO the way they've written it. So you can do it in, as a flexible spending account. That's more of a ledger entry versus a bank account. Your employer is doing that. It's only through your employer. Um, the biggest caveat there is it's use it or lose it. So when you put, you can put up to three grand away, $3,050 in 2023 into that FSA, but it's use it or lose it. So it, when the time you get to the end of the year, if you haven't used your three grand that you put away, you lose it. Now you, in fact, get till March 15th of the following year, but it's, it's, there's a cutoff. And if you haven't spent it, you, you, you lose it. So that's why people also go out and buy eyeglasses and things like that before the end of the year to make sure they've used up their flexible spending accounts. Um, the other mechanism in the flexible spending account that's worth noting to, for folks is you can use your entire year's election in January. So if you tell your employers, so it's so important to, to when you do that open enrollment and you don't blow off that email that you were that you were joking about, and I'm not, I'm not going to pay attention to it. Go through it, log in, and tell them that in 2023 I, I'm going to I'm going to spend this much out of pocket, probably three grand, probably that maximum. And if I have a procedure or all of my drugs are I'm, I'm, you know are paying for in that first quarter and I burned 3000 in the first quarter I can get that money even though I haven't paid into the flexible spending plan until I'm playing it, paying through it evenly throughout the year so my employer's fronted me that money I could quit on on February 1st or on groundhog's day and I never have to pay it back I don't recommend doing that but it you the employer actually is at risk for that money during that time so beware be aware that you can do that because a lot of people uh, you know, can take real advantage of that. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the more we talk, the more I realize uh, how these healthcare brokers can help out quite a bit. Uh, Cause what, you know, you're, you, you live and breathe this stuff and I'm, I'm barely hanging on, but I realize now that you gotta do, you have to really investigate what your plan allows. Uh, and these health savings accounts uh, and are really important to help people save money. We offer it to our employees at TCOID. 
within these large insurance companies, they all carry different plans. And I think that adds to the, the complexity and the confusion that people have. You know, they think, oh, I have Blue Cross Blue Shield PPO. That's all they offer. But all of these can offer all many of the plans you're talking about. Is that correct? That's, yeah, that's absolutely correct. So that when you talk about, you know, Anthem and Blue Cross and Cigna or Kaiser or any of those, that typically describes the network of doctors that are within their plan. So typically, if you're a Blue Cross and your doc's in Blue Cross, your, your, your doc's going to be covered in any Blue Cross plan, typically. Uh, but there, there can be a variety of Blue Cross plans. One could be a PPO, one could be an HMO, one can be an HDHP. Um, and they can have different different premiums, different deductibles. So it's it, you've got to understand what's your doctor network versus what's the framing, the structural framing of that plan itself between deductibles and premiums and gatekeepers, et cetera. So um, you, you have to know a little bit about all how all that works. But fundamentally, total cost, premiums, deductibles, plus cost share, and are my 3Ds covered? Yeah, if I've got those things understood, then I'm making an informed decision about my health. Well, thank you, George. Now, uh, as we close, I have one more question, but as we close, yeah. where could folks, uh, besides your article and the other lecture you gave, the three articles, uh, where else could they get more information? Is it from the website of the organization that you run? Yeah, so diabetesleadership.org will have information on there. Um, I, there's a lot of a lot of lot of other sites as well that will offer. JDRF has a great uh, health insurance section on there. Um, I, you know, this is this is go anywhere that that can help you. Uh, Diabetes Link has some great information. In fact, we've given them some great information that's up there as well. Um, and and if you have questions, ask, reach out, seek. Whether it, whether you're sending it to us, asking your broker, asking your HR, you know there is no such. The only dumb question is the one that's not asked, as we as, you know as we as the experience winds up telling us. So I, I would urge everybody to uh, you know to to make an informed decision um, and and go through the effort. It's not as bad as it seems, and you'll be happy you've done it because you'll you'll know. And 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 one other comment of you know the other thing insurance companies love to do. Their favorite word is no. <laughs> yeah, I could have told you that. Um, so if you get a no, don't accept it. Yeah. Fight. Keep, keep pushing. Fight. They count on you saying, they count on you just accepting it and caving. Uh, you know, fight. Get you get the prior authorization. Get the, make the appeal. Be the squeaky wheel because we have needs and our needs should be met and and the doctor honestly should prevail. Yeah. Diabetes is not a rare disease. It's not an inexpensive one either. Um, the listeners should know that we just opened uh, uh, our access part of our website and it's a six month project uh, getting all the different uh, programs uh, whether it's uh, from the pharmaceutical and device companies themselves to get medications and devices easier, less expensive, and some of sometimes for free. It's, it's a very extensive part of our website, tcoid tcoid.org slash access. Okay, um, George, last question briefly. What kind of insurance do you have? I actually have a PPO. So, um, and it's, it's good coverage, but I'm the plan administrator. So oh, no um, wonder I, you got the best. I, I have, I have a little power uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I can, I can make sure that my people are covered. I, we pass rebates through at point of sale to all of our employees. So no one is faced with list price on our drugs. Uh, and uh, we do not accum you know, do, use those copay accumulator programs. We, 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 we do the things that are patient friendly because uh, I understand how important it is. Well, thank you for that. Well, listen, George, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I mean, uh, we want to have you back and talk about Medicare, but that's, that's a topic of a whole symposium. And I want to thank you for taking time out of your very busy day with all the different hats that you wear. And it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Had a great time. Take care. Okay, George.